Hello, welcome to this clip going through um, how we test for common aqueous ions. We'll focus in particular on what happens if you have them all together in one sample. So I'll go through the construction of both types of equation, the main balanced symbol equation, and also the simplest ionic version of this. In addition, we'll look at how to write down the observations so it's clear to the person reading that you've correctly written out what you've seen, as opposed to something that's ambiguous or maybe a little bit confusing. So the first thing to consider is why in the first place do we have to think about testing for ions in a certain order? So I've now listed them in the correct order in which they need to be tested for. So I'll quickly explain why this is. So the first thing to do is to consider what the observations are and why they're unique to that particular ion. Now what we need to do next is make sure that we're doing it in an order so that one particular observation doesn't mask another. So carbonate has to come first because it reacts with the silver plus ions to make a white precipitate. So that would interfere with the chloride test. So silver carbonate would be white precipitate and carbonate has to come before sulfate because the Ba2 plus ions we use in the sulfate test would react with carbonate to make barium carbonate. Both of those compounds are white solids so they will appear as a white precipitate and mask the white precipitate you're looking for in the sulfate test and in the chloride test. So using Ba2 plus ions in the sulfate test would interfere with the halide test because Ba2 plus ions react with chloride minus ions. So the sulfate test has to come before the halide test. So because the sulfate test and the chloride test both give white precipitates, you need to filter off the insoluble barium sulfate precipitate before going any further. So in the chloride test, when you use silver nitrate as your source of Ag+, you add a little bit of HNO3. What this does is it protects against the formation of AgCO3 and it gets rid of any AgCO3 that's uh, left over from the, sorry, any carbonate ions, I beg your pardon, um, that are left over from the first test. Okay, so that leaves us with the NH4 plus test, the ammonium ion. So you'll notice that uh, the NaOH um, reagent, sodium hydroxide, is obviously an alkali, isn't it? So therefore this is done in the very last because the first three involve the use of acids. Well, at least the use of acid takes place in the CO3 test and also the CO- test. So for this last test to work, it needs to be done after all the others so there's no acids left that might interfere with OH-. So the presence of the warm NaOH um, will also neutralise any remaining acid. So I've got some calcium carbonate in a test tube. I'm going to add some sulfuric acid to it so you can see the effervescence given off. So clearly to confirm that that was carbon dioxide you need to pass it through lime water and the lime water would go milky if uh, the carbon dioxide was produced. But you can see there's an instant reaction when acid is added to calcium carbonate. So apologies for the echo there as the embedded video um, comes across. But if this reaction was carried out in a carbonate solution, the observation would be the same. So I chose to do it on a solid carbonate just to emphasize the fizzing that you get pretty much straight away. So your balanced equation, I'm going to use sodium carbonate as my example, uh, is as you can see on the right. It's obviously a production of a salt, NaCl. CO2 is a gas and H2O is a liquid. So the simplest ionic equation is quite easy to do here. Uh, what you do is you look at everything that is aqueous and you break them up into their constituent ions. So that would obviously be sodium carbonate, um, hydrochloric acid and uh, sodium chloride. So you can simplify that uh, by getting rid of what we call spectator ions. These are ions that appear both sides. And they're not really reacting, they're just sort of floating around and swapping partners around. So that leaves us with a simplest ionic equation, and obviously we can write down effervescence or fizzing as the acid is added as our observation. 
So, the next thing to look at is the sulfate ion. Taking care here, because barium chloride is toxic. Moving that out of the way. We now take some sulfuric acid. Add it to the barium. You can clearly see a white precipitate forming of barium sulfate. So the observation here would be white precipitate forming. So let's deal with the observation first. You'd have a white precipitate produced, as you can see, but if all your ions were mixed together like we talked about earlier, you'd now have to filter this off because the next test coming up in a minute is the chloride test, and that also produces a white precipitate. So let's look at our balanced equation. We're going to assume that our sulphate was sodium sulphate, for example, even though I used H2SO4 as my source of sulphate ions. So the simplest ion, uh, sorry, the balanced equation is written, as, uh, as you can see, barium chloride and sodium sulphate. And to get your simplest ionic equation, you take all the aqueous um, species, so sodium sulphate, barium chloride, and sodium chloride, and turn it into uh, their ions, and then you can cancel either side, as I did before. So not forgetting your state symbols at all times, the simplest ionic equation shows how the precipitate is made. So your precipitate is your barium sulphate. Let's now move on to the halide test. So you can see I've got three test tubes, one containing chloride ions, one containing bromide ions, and one containing iodide ions. So I'm going to take some silver nitrate and add it to each of them. So I'm going to leave the label there so you can see that I'm actually taking it from the silver nitrate stop bottle. And you can see white precipitate of silver chloride cream precipitate of silver bromide and a yellow precipitate of silver iodide. So this confirms the presence of the three ions. There's a little saying you can use to help you remember the colours. Clever women buy cheese in Yorkshire. So chloride is a white precipitate, CW. Bromide is a cream precipitate, BC, by cheese. And iodide is a yellow precipitate in Yorkshire, IY. So now I'm going to put the balanced equations with their simplest ionic uh, versions. Worked out exactly the same way that we did before, and colour-coded. Uh, so the observations, all you'd say for chloride is white precipitate, for bromide cream precipitate, and for iodide yellow precipitate. So now let's go on to the final one, which is the uh, NH4+. The damp litmus paper, you can see that it's damp where it's see-through. So it's a piece of damp litmus paper, and that's going to test for the ammonia. So normally we do this by gently heating with a Bunsen burner, but for safety reasons, because I'm filming this, I'm going to be doing it using a water bath to do my heating for me. So I'm going to add a little bit of sodium hydroxide, now, ammonia is very soluble in water, so you're not going to see much bubbling, but you can clearly see the two solutions mixing. And what I'm going to do is to hold the litmus paper at the top, and you can clearly see that it's gone quite blue, showing that um, something alkaline has been given off, and that would be the test for the ammonia. So the salt I'm testing for, we're testing this on, is ammonium chloride, NH4Cl. So I do my balanced equation using my ammonium chloride as my source of NH4+. So just like before, I identify the constituent ions of my aqueous ionic solutions and species. I'm using exactly the same technique as before to get rid of my spectator ions by cancelling on either side the things that turn up um, twice. 
I'm left with NH4 plus plus OH minus giving me NH3 plus H2O. Now NH3 is a gas, so the observation that you get is not bubbling, but the uh, change in colour of the litmus paper. So damp red litmus paper turns blue. It has to be damp because ammonia, the gas, dissolves in water and uh, it forms ammonium hydroxide, but that's part of another clip. So the ammonium hydroxide that's formed in the damp litmus paper is an alkali itself, so then the litmus can turn blue. If the litmus paper is not damp, this won't work, it has to be damp. So what we'll do now is do a quick summary of all the reactions we've looked at. Um, so the next slide will just have a table that lists them all for you. Okay, so this covers um, all of the ions we've just looked at, and it also just mentions in the third column that's the observation for a positive result. We need a positive observation always when we're describing what's happening. So it gives you the reason for each observation and the ionic equation that talks about what's going on. Okay, so hopefully this has been a useful clip, just taking through some of these ion tests, helping you remember them, how to actually word them, and... Uh, until next time, thanks for listening and see you soon.